Say good afternoon to everyone. So this is the best time of the day, uh, as always, after the break. A warm welcome to everyone, and maybe we will be uh, a few people more in the room. I would like to uh, welcome you to the session on uh, leveraging public finance in future energy markets. As mentioned before the break, uh, the rooms changed, just to make sure that you are in the right room. The plan for the next uh, one and a half hours is, uh, first, I will pr uh, present uh, a few slides on global trends in renewable energy markets, and then I will ask um, the honorable panelists on stage, and we'll start uh, with a few questions uh, around public, private, how to le leverage public money, uh, how to leverage private money with, with public money. So this will be uh, the centerpiece of, of this session, and I look very much forward uh, to doing that. My name is Karsten Löffle. I'm co-heading the Frankfurt School UNEP Collaborating Center for, sustainable, uh, for, for uh, Climate and Sustainable Energy Finance. So in that uh, way, I deal with uh, sustainable and, and uh, climate every day. Before that, I was responsible at Allianz, a, pr a pretty large insurance company, uh, with respect to mainstreaming climate in asset management in investments and insurance. So that's a quite a long-term um, uh, background I have in, in climate and renewable energy. With that, um, do we have the slides available? Perfect. So we can just jump uh, with this, that's good. So it's only a few slides and I will make it very brief. It's, uh, the purpose is just to provide a, a very brief introduction into the latest trends. What it can be seen on this slide is that the uh, global new investments in renewable energy were pretty much stable uh, from 2016 to 2017 with plus 2%, that's not too much. The share of solar is very, very high. Uh, now it's 57% of uh, new renewable energy plants. And with China, we will see it on a, a slide a little uh, in, in, a, in a minute, um, has 58% um, of um, new investments. So this is remarkable. Here you can see this. Um, the, glo the, the global new investment in renewable energy by region. So China has a very large chunk. Uh, overall, that's across renewable energies, so not only solar. It's 45%. It's nearly half of the new investments, followed uh, by Europe and still United States um, on the same level as Europe. Middle East and India and Brazil um, not bad, but there's, I think, uh, quite some potential to, uh, to do more and to, to have larger investments over time. Then next, what can be seen on this slide is uh, the, uh, the distribution across developing countries and developed countries. This is pretty remarkable. So a trend we already saw uh, in 2016 now ex exacerbated as the share of uh, the industrialized uh, countries decreased while the share of developing countries increased considerably, mostly due to China. Um, but when we look at the ab uh, absolute numbers, it's developing countries decrease by 19%, while developing countries increase by 20%. Looking at Germany and, and uh, the European Union, it's pretty remarkable that um, both have minus 35% in, uh, in new investments in renewable energy, while China is plus 31%. So this is, uh, again, very remarkable. It shows a very uh, different regional development, as can be seen on, on this slide as well. So when you look at the uh, top middle of the top center of the, this slide, you see that Europe is falling uh, pretty much behind. It seems there's a structural change ongoing even, um, and some longer term developments. And with China leading the pack, it can be seen here very prominently. So what does it mean? We will come to that in a second. Um, it's 
This is the um, second but last slide with compare, comparing renewable energy and uh, energy produced by fossil fuel sources and nuclear. So what we see here is uh, clearly that the net uh, power generation capacity added uh, last year uh, was remarkably on the renewable energy side. It's much more than 50%. Uh, it's 68% even, uh, compared to coal uh, and gas with 14 and 15%, adding uh, to the total. So that is a big shift. Uh, that is only continuing what we have been seeing before. And last but not least, this slide is maybe showing it all, with China leading the pack, um, with uh, the United States following, and uh, quite a number of countries, larger countries, uh, following. Now we have uh, the, uh, the, the opportunity to listen of uh, some public and private uh, stakeholders, investors, governments, how they see the landscape going forward what roles uh, different actors can play. And this is very much to my heart, as I think most of the instruments in financing renewable energy are already there. They have to be applied, and that means people. People have to work together, and I look forward to learning about, uh, more about that. So it's innovative partnerships in contrast to innovative uh, financing instruments. And with that, um, I invite my honorable panel to come on stage, and I will do the introductions then when everyone is on stage. Please. Would you like to come to my right? Thank you. I would like to sit in the middle. Thanks. So, before I do the introduction to the panel, I'd like to uh, ask for support. Uh, we have prepared uh, a question. Please, over to you. Good afternoon again. I have a fresh polling question for all of you. And as you can see on the screen, it is, which way of public and private collaboration looks most promising for scaling renewable energy and energy efficiency partnerships in future energy markets? The first choice, investment partnerships, already has a few votes. Blended finance, public role towards regulation, or is there no collaboration needed? So I'll be back at the end of the session with your answers. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you so much. So with that, I'd like to do a brief round of introduction to my honorable panel, starting uh, with the Honorable Minister of, uh, for Energy of Thailand, Dr. Siri Jirapong Pan. Is this correctly pronounced? Oh, I am I'm glad to do <laughs> that I, I made it. Um, with the Honorable Deputy Minister for Energy of Ghana, Mr. William Uvurako Aidu. With uh, Dr. Se Yon Kwong, Director General for Climate Change, Energy and Environmental Affairs Bureau of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. With Mr. Ali Zerwali, Director of International Cooperation and Partnership of Masen, Morocco, with Ms. Nora Noara Kibir, co-founder and managing director of Microenergy International, with Mr. Carsten Fülster, country manager for Germany, um, Switzerland and Austria, I think, um, of the International Finance Corporation, the IFC, and last but not least, uh, with Steve Sawyer, Secretary General of the Global Wind Energy Council. First, um, I want to come to you, uh, Minister. The, um, the, there are some systemic barriers um, in the system, obviously. Um, I, when, when we talk about systematic barriers um, that need to be overcome to leverage private investment in renewable energy, even in, in energy efficiency projects, in, in all markets, but in particular in, in your market. How can, from your perspective, public finance help to overcome these barriers? 
Hello? It's working? Yeah, yes. It's working. Mm. Thank you, uh, Excellencies, distinguished participants to this Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue. In the past two days, we have heard about technology, policy, uh, uh, and all the pertinent matters. And I think for this session, for, uh, and a session earlier and this session, we are talking about the real mover to make things happen. That's money. Mm -hmm. And financing is a critical component to make uh, what our aspirations become reality. In Thailand, we have a power system of a peak load of about 30,000 megawatts. Peak load, and we have a fossil fuel base load power plants of around that capacity, about 35,000 megawatts. And on top of that, we have uh, installed renewable energy, both in solar system, wind system, and biomass, biogas as well, to the uh, range of around 9,000 megawatts. So we have, uh, over the past 10 years, quite extensive experience in both uh, financing renewable energy and uh, energy efficiency program from both the public and the private financing as such. Yes, we, our strategy is to leverage our investment in public financing on various programs to bring in private investment, to attract, to induce private investment to come in. But private investment has a lot more consideration than just looking at the public financing and financing renewable energy projects versus energy efficiency projects <clears throat> have two different characteristics altogether. And I think discussing both of them in the same context would leave out all the per pertinent characteristics that are quite relevant and critical to their success. Thailand has, uh, we have a program that would uh, collect and invest about $300 million per year in terms of uh, promoting renewable energy and energy efficiency programs. The funding for that is collected through a, a fee uh, taken on top, a fee of around one cent per liter for every diesel and gasoline sold. So uh, diesel and gasoline consumers in transport sector pay for the renewable energy and energy efficiency program. <clears throat> for renewable energy, the government started with a small pilot program in terms of uh, wind, uh, uh, wind turbine and uh, solar farm. But as of about from uh, 15 years back, that we had all the private investment in terms of uh, renewable energy, solar and wind, particularly some biomass, some from uh, garbage as well. Those are financed by private sector on assurance of a, an offtake agreement, what we call power purchase agreement, that is offered by the government on a price premium which we uh, call started off as an adder to the retail market price and at and, and advent to a feed in tariff at very high rate. For example, our uh, retail rate, our wholesale rate would be around eight cents per kilowatt hour of today. Our renewable, some renewable pro uh, projects had a tariff of around uh, more than double that, some nearly uh, 20 cents per, per unit, per kilowatt hour. So that has been the funding principle driving the private investment. The certainty of an off-taker, which is government buying at a high rate. But those are learning experience that I think would not be sustainable up to this moment. So we are discontinuing the program of uh, subsidizing renewable energy investment because from the experience we heard in these last two days and from the experience that 
we are seeing every country is moving towards uh, more innovative financing, plus the uh, fast-paced evolution of a new technology that uh, we are looking at creating an, a different market whereby renewable energy has to be competitive with uh, conventional fossil fuel at grid parity level. And we are draw, drawing a policy uh, framework to make that a sustainable uh, development program of that. For energy efficiency program, they are two different things. Not too many large companies participate in energy efficiency program. So in Thailand, the government takes the lead in conducting, executing various energy efficiency programs. We have for over the past 10 years a very successful program we call uh, number five label that we put on uh, home appliances, particularly air conditioning and uh, refrigerators. Being a, uh, in a humid country in the tropic, electricity con uh, pay, uh, bill for air conditioning and refrigerator constitute about one third of the total energy bill. So any savings in terms of the electricity consumption for the air conditioning units and refrigerators will be a great help to, to, to reduce our uh, carbon uh, CO2 generation within Thailand. So we have uh, standardized certain uh, uh, efficiency requirement on uh, power consumption per BTU cooling of, uh, elect, uh, of air conditioning. And the public has created the awareness in public that when they go to buy air conditioner, appliances, refrigerator, they'll look for the number five label. Mm -hmm. And if they saw it, they'll buy it. And it's a good marketing ploy that people then would then identify themselves as being a good citizen and saving money for themselves, buying only appliances with number five. So let me stop with that, that with the public funding of a program to create uh, government funding of create a program to create public awareness. We were successful in inducing private investment to produce appliances with a local energy efficiency label of number five so that they are competitive versus vis a vis import uh, appliances that can't be registered with this energy efficiency program. So we are spurring private investment into industries that support energy efficient use uh, of electricity for appliances at home. So that's what we are leveraging uh, public investment that would induce private investment into industry sectors that use energy, but not directly, mm -hmm. not, not necessarily directly involved in energy sector itself. Let me stop at that. Yeah. I think my time is up for at the moment, <laughs> even though I have a few more stories to tell, but let's do it on the second yeah. round. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Siri. Th that is uh, very interesting. So it, it shows um, that there are more than one, there's more than one way uh, to get the public and the private sector interacting uh, with each other. Um, and I, I find this, uh, this focus on, on, on the industrial side to, to leverage uh, investments in, 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 in industries, uh, very interesting, uh, a very interesting path to, to bring uh, the, the private uh, investments uh, to fruition. With that, I, I'd like to um, move to Carsten Fulster of the IFC. Um, I learned over time, and, and at my time with uh, Allianz, I, I was a little bit involved in, in that, that you um, developed a few programs um, trying to involve larger uh, investments, uh, investors, like insurance companies, pension funds, 
uh, to co-invest uh, basically uh, with IFC money. Uh, I would be interested to, to learn what was your first thought, uh, why, why did you go that way? Um, what were the critical factors in making it successful in particular? That I have lots of questions that maybe we, we can come to later. <laughs> Well, let me try to, to address those. I think we should, should start with the, with the premise that the overall investment money required to address all investment needs in the infrastructure sectors are going into the trillions. And for that, no public sector funding is sufficient, neither in the developed world nor in the developing world. And even if we were to add all the development finance capital on top of it, it would still not fill that gap. It's an order of magnitude that ultimately then drove the international finance institution into a situation whereby we are, were saying we need to find mechanisms whereby we can crowd in the private sector funding. We have heard it in an earlier panel this morning where there was mentioning of there's no shortage of funding itself. The challenge is that the funds are not available where the demand for the infrastructure investments are and the infrastructure developments are happening mostly in the emerging market countries. So with that, um, we essentially partnered with a number of insurance companies and uh, pension funds to overcome, first of all, particularly with regard here to Europe, one uh, hurdle which is the regula regulatory constraint just coming out of the Solvency II requirements that ultimately are geared towards protecting the investor who is putting its money behind life insurances and pension capital. So we needed to find a way in, st in structuring the flow of funds for infrastructure investments into the emerging markets in such a way that if these projects were to face um, economic or political or um, commercial constraints, that the first loss does not affect the insurance subscribers or the premium payers, but it ultimately are two layers of what we call private loss that we uh, implemented. And some of these funds are structured in various ways. I, I don't want to spend too much details on, on this that this risk buffer ultimately is making that the remaining part then provided by the insurance companies is ultimately satisfactory to the um, Solvency II criteria and can thereby be deployed into infrastructure investments in the emerging markets. So we have by now signed four of these um, agreements, each of about um, half a billion. Um, so the, the, the ones um, that are most known is uh, the Alliance uh, Agreement. Uh, uh, we just recently signed a couple of weeks ago uh, additional agreement, agreements with uh, Prudential, with AXA and Swiss Re, each uh, again providing uh, half a billion on, of capital that will be co-invested with IFC funding in, into infrastructure projects that we would be investing in. So it's always an IFC component from an investment perspective coming along with it that ultimately then drives that these uh, funds can uh, be deployed uh, into emerging market projects. Allow me to also address very quickly another aspect of, you know, what kind of partnership is needed because I think it's, you know, we have heard it also this morning, there's a scarcity of, of bankable projects and that ties very quickly into, well, it's not just about the funding being available, but we also need projects that these funds ultimately can be invested in. For that, um, the IFC uh, built a partnership together with, world, with the World Bank and uh, member governments to essentially streamline and standardize the procurement process and the bidding process for solar energy. This is known under the name of scaling solar and ultimately resulted in that the bidder ultimately is bidding for a tariff that is of a project that is entirely de-risked because it is known on which side the project is going to be built, which permits are necessary in order to start building it, where the power is ultimately um, fed into the grid. So it also includes um, a financing component 
and uh, a power purchase agreement which is f f fully f uh, negotiated. So with that entire package being designed, ultimately any investor would know what the key risks of that project is in order to implement it and could start immediately after the bidding uh, contest to finalize financing and then uh, immediately start construction. So this program has been established in Samia with extreme success because we achieved ultimately with two bidders a tariff of 6.1 and 8 cents per kilowatt hour, which so far were absolutely unheard of in sub-Saharan Africa. And so it shows that the standardization of contracts, the, the you know, full, fully thought through process of the bidding process ultimately can result in tangible benefits for the emerging market countries. Similar programs are currently on their way in Ethiopia, in Senegal. Senegal was also mentioned earlier this morning, so we just finished there the, the tender process um, a few weeks ago. And we gradually want to roll it out to many other countries globally so that we can generate more investment in private sector projects. Thank you. I, I would like to ask uh, one brief follow-up question, Carsten. Um, and that goes again to these uh, partnerships. You see, up till now, so there is not too much uh, that is similar that can be seen in the market. See, what actually makes uh, the partnership you uh, developed different to what we have seen before? Be or why haven't we seen it, to put it in, the, in different words, why haven't we seen it uh, maybe years ago? Well, it's, I think it's driven by at least one driver, which is um, also the extremely low interest rate environment and where pension capital and life insurance capital is, is looking for higher returns. So one had somehow to, to bridge that gap of allowing that capital to flow to projects. And we also heard the number that the returns on projects in the emerging markets generate higher returns allow the, the money to flow in that direction. Uh, but you needed to find mechanisms in order to make that happen. And it took quite a lengthy negotiation process with regulators, with um, governments, to ultimately, you know, rating agencies were involved in it, um, so that in, the, in, in, in a nutshell, there was a product whereby institutional investors, um, financial institutions um, understood what the benefit of that structure is, also without having a heavy uh, scrutiny on the due diligence process itself, because it should be mentioned that if IFC is undertaking the due diligence, then this money will be co-invested without a very stringent, um, independent, additional due diligence processes, because well, if you have just the due diligence process is costing so much in transaction costs that it would also then um, affect the return on these investments again. Mm. Thank you. I, I think that is really critical yeah. um, to, to that. Um, very good. Um, Minister, uh, see, from a Ghanaian perspective, see, we, what you have heard from, from Dr. Siri and from, from IFC, see, how, how does, does that speak to you in your context, from, with, with your perspective from being responsible for Ghana and its development uh, with respect to, to energy? Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think um, Mr. Carson has yeah. actually uh, alluded to most of the challenges that yeah. um, we in the emerging market of which sub-Saharan um, Africa Ghana um, forms part of, but I will add a few more by giving a, a background to Ghana. Ghana, um, a population of 25 million, um, we have electricity access um, a rate of 85%, which is quite high for sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there are some challenges um, as far as um, the remaining last mile, so to speak, 15%, um, that we intend as um, a government to fill that with renewables. And that is where the challenge comes in, the private and the public um, interaction. The IFC, the AFD from France, um, KFW Germany, they've all been helping um, by providing the funding and um, giving assurance to the private sector that um, when they invest 
they are assured of um, making um, some returns on their money and um, totally the risk by virtue of some of the insurance policies that we put in place, the PCOAs that um, um, we negotiate with them, that they are sure that Ghana is um, a very safe, uh, politically safe country, and um, it's a gateway to the sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, we've had um, a very good uh, political transition. So um, the private sector, when they are coming to Ghana in particular, are uh, assured of um, making money and um, being able to take back whatever returns they make. But the problem, uh, as far as we are concerned right now, is some of you might be aware, we had some uh, challenges in generation some three years back. And as a result, the then government had signed um, a lot of PPAs, which now has resulted in us having excess generation. Now, the challenge for us as a government is to find ways of um, weeding out some of these um, existing PPAs that have not reached financial close so that we can create the space for renewables to be um, filled with it. However, having said that, whilst we are waiting to do this um, clearance, there are huge opportunities in the distributive solar and, of course, um, mini grids. Um, that is where the challenge is. Ghana, as a country, have also embarked on changing all our balls within the country. We've actually started procurement of um, solar lamps for the whole country. Uh, we're changing all the lab. I'm talking about um, energy efficiency now. We're changing all that with the help, again, of um, public financing. We're using money from the Korean government and um, also from the Chinese um, government in combination with the locally generated funding from a local government. And then we're hoping to change all these lights. And the work that we have done, uh, at the end of it, we should be able to save something in a region of 200 megawatts, which is equivalent to one power station. Um, so these are some of the things that we are doing in Ghana. But the challenge as far as the public financing and the private is concerned, in Ghana, we've breached it by um, uh, assuring the private sector that any money by way of um, loans or concessionary loans that we take is used to unlend to the private sector so they feel assured that the uh, returns is guaranteed and that um, they will come in and do their work um, without any uh, problems at all. Yeah. Um, one quick follow-up question. The what is the, the share of, um, of foreign private investment coming into Ghana? Is, he, is there some, some, some uh, serious money inflowing, or is then private investment uh, coming uh, more prominently from uh, local, from national sources? No, um, right now the generation, uh, the public generation, uh, the public backed generation within the country is about 40%, and the IPPs, um, which is mainly foreign, is about 60%. Mm. Um, Money is coming into Ghana, um, individuals who come in, and the government um, enter, like I said, into put call option agreements with them, which assures them of um, their returns. Mm. Um, so we are getting some very good money. And in fact, there's so many people knocking on our doors to come in, but because of the excess capacity nature, we are asking them to have some patience whilst we sort ourselves out. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Kwon, um, see, w when we look at the Korean situation, so the, the share of nuclear and then coal power generation is expected to reduce, uh, I, I think, as a result of the energy transition that is currently happening in, in Korea. Uh, maybe you can introduce um, uh, to us the Korean government's uh, plan to secure energy supply beyond renewable energy sources. And secondly, I would be interested how much do you think the Korean energy transition can contribute actually uh, to the achievement uh, of the Korean uh, uh, NDC, the National Determined Contribution Target? Uh, thank you, Mr. Leffler, and ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I'd like to offer you a general sketch of uh, 
uh, Korea's Renewable Energy 3020, which is core scheme for energy transition in Korea. I think it is all the more important and meaningful to be, to be able to do so here in Germany, which is a first mover in energy transition as Korea tries to uh, seek a uh, uh, long journey by uh, for securing and watching the energy steps and footprints of Germany. Uh, since the new government was launched uh, last May, uh, Korea has indeed uh, been creating, uh, exerting great efforts for expanding uh, clean uh, energy. Um, indeed, uh, Renewable Energy 3020, uh, which was announced last December, aims to achieve 20% uh, of renewable energy generation uh, by 2030. I think energy transition is a uh, norm of the day and is a sort of uh, zeitgeist. Uh, why? I'll give you three reasons uh, in a Korean context and background. Uh, first, um, it is to ensure long-term energy security. Uh, Korea is energy scarce energy island country and is the uh, eighth largest importer of energy uh, outside uh, countries. It is why we are seeking to uh, uh, improve energy independence and also to diversify energy mix uh, to a domestic and the supply in a clean and stable way. A second, the Korean uh, government had to respond uh, to the increasing sensitivity of the people about the potential and substantial risks of the uh, nuclear power plants uh, because uh, in the wake of Fukushima accident in 2011 and also Pohang earthquakes, uh, which happened uh, several times in recent years, uh, in a southern, uh, southeastern part of Korea uh, with a density of nuclear power plants out there. And then Korea seeking to meet the demand of uh, people uh, is expanding the supply of clean and safe energy. Clean and safe because uh, by uh, gradual phase out of coal and also downsizing of nuclear power source. And third, it is uh, to achieve a global uh, goals we are committed to after a Paris Agreement and uh, SDGs. Um, the one, when more than 80% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from energy sector, um, the, uh, the renewable energy is uh, definitely an uh, efficient and effective uh, area that should be uh, addressed um, in a soul searching way. Now I turn to the uh, uh, renewable energy uh, tw uh, 3020. Uh, the share of renewable energy uh, in Korea by power source ge generation in 2017 is only 7% uh, compared to 30.3% uh, for uh, nuclear power and 45.3% uh, for coal and 16.9% uh, for LNG. So uh, the Korean government plans to increase the share of renewable energy generation for electricity uh, from 7% to 20% uh, by 2030. To achieve this goal, 48.7 uh, gigawatts uh, of new installed capacity is forecasted to be needed. And this will mainly come from 20.8 uh, gigawatts uh, of solar PVs and 16.5 gigawatts of wind projects, uh, representing 64% and 34% respectively. This renewable energy target will be uh, mainly implemented by uh, large-scale uh, uh, projects uh, with, and with other uh, pack, uh, project items of solar uh, PV projects uh, in rural areas and small-scale uh, projects with cooperatives and also um, uh, projects for residential areas, especially in cities. Uh, furthermore, in order to uh, foster deployment of renewable energy source and uh, enable us to meet our end uh, target. Um, there is also a need to develop such uh, technologies as uh, energy storage system and smart grids and electric vehicles and CCU as carbon capture use and st uh, storage. And uh, with regards to uh, investment package, Korea plans to invest uh, almost 95 billion US dollars uh, for new installed capacity by 2030. And the figure of uh, almost uh, 95 billion dollars uh, includes uh, 15 billion dollars from uh, government budget and also other funding source from uh, public and private sectors. And the government will also form a collaborative team uh, comprising uh, members of uh, both 
public and private sectors to monitor the progress of uh, our plan. And uh, with regards to the uh, questions you, you, you asked, um, Korea, as I mentioned, is an energy scarce country. Uh, but um, some some people wor is worried about that the nuclear pop the phase out of nuclear power plants will threaten the security of energy in Korea. But uh, it's a long it's a long term period. Uh, it, it takes uh, about uh, for 65 uh, target periods 65 years of target period for phase out of nuclear power, and then uh, six uh, nuclear power plants on the construct on the construction continue to be built. So uh, I think there's no uh, threat to the energy security. And also, the but uh, with regards to the um, uh, gas as a uh, breaching energy uh, for the uh, uh, achieving uh, Paris climate goals, and that it will increase by 16.9% uh, to 18.8%. Uh, so some portion of gas will be increased. And then also, we. Um, uh, seeking uh, for the energy uh, dialogue or energy cooperation among North East Asian countries, and also we are seeking for energy interconnection. But it's, uh, it's under a review, and only uh, private companies do that. But we also, but Korean government is uh, is uh, supporting the kind of initiative uh, that the global uh, and North East Asian super grid, uh, power grid, uh, they can be linked uh, each each other by electricity swap. And also, it can bring peace and reconciliation uh, for co -pros uh, prosperity uh, in the Korean Peninsula and beyond. And also for the uh, end this target, uh, I think uh, you know, uh, 2016, the Korean government announced a set of goal of uh, greenhouse gas reduction roadmap. Uh, in the uh, according to the roadmap, uh, Korean government plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, uh, by 37% uh, uh, from uh, business as usual uh, by 2030. And then uh, that, that at the time, uh, if we uh, achieve uh, the, uh, our uh, renewable energy plan, um, for initial, initially it was estimated 64.5 uh, 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 tons of, uh, million tons of safety equivalent. But now, uh, last year's uh, uh, eighth basic plan for long-term uh, energy supply and demand, uh, it, it can be bigger than the initial cost. So we can, uh, the, the contribution of uh, our renewable energy uh, 30, 30, 20 will give uh, more boost to achieve NDCs uh, by 84.5 million tons of CO2 uh, by 2030. Thank you. Uh, well, you mentioned uh, this round table with private and public sector participants. So maybe you can add uh, one sentence. So what, what do you uh, expect from that to happen? So how, to, uh, how to evolve uh, cooperation from that? And uh, are there any targets uh, what you expect from, from these round tables? Yeah. Uh, collaboration is very important. And as I mentioned, in our government sector, interagency collaboration is also uh, underway. And then our um, prime minister's office is uh, coordinating the consultative body to uh, monitor the progress of renewable energy uh, plan, renewable energy 3020. And also, we are seeking for uh, uh, PPP, as public private partnership. And then now, uh, interestingly, we have, we are, uh, ally uh, with Denmark, you know, which is called Green Growth Alliance. And then uh, Denmark, uh, the, the, you know, the leadership of uh, Prime, Prime Minister Lasmussen, uh, they uh, already launched uh, P4G, uh, partnering uh, for green growth and global goals 2030. And then we also, we are partner of P4G. And P4G means, you know, partnership of partnerships. And Korea also planning to uh, uh, participate as uh, a board member and partner. So in that sense, uh, we are preparing for a national platform. Uh, the national platform means also the platform of uh, partnerships and networks to increase, uh, promote uh, green growth and green economy. And now, uh, government sector is leading right now, but uh, more and more, we uh, give more uh, leverage and give more 
uh, authority or power to uh, to a civil society and also the uh, local uh, governments. So we, uh, when you think of three dimensions, first high-level political uh, dimension, also local government and the on the ground, you know, residents uh, level, I uh, think uh, it's more and more decentralized and more digitalized, uh, so we can give more uh, authority to the uh, local and civil society, and those national platform and partnership also can do that. But, but initial stage, uh, the government uh, should uh, give uh, playing a, play a role, uh, so we give some upfront investment, maybe a. Uh, 15 or 20 percent of uh, the funding, and also leverage uh, private uh, finance. One of the examples is to, to fund. You know, fund. The most important thing is to how to induce uh, uh, the participation of local residents and the cooperatives and the farmers and rural area. The residents very important. So we are seeking for many uh, ways to induce uh, local uh, residents' participation in our partnership. But now we are already, uh, but what is, is a very initial stage, so we are more and more want to hear from other uh, practices and experience to complement and more develop our partnership uh, initiative. Thank you. Mm, thank you. So there's this big uh, success in Morocco with solar. Uh, see, you are much uh, and then very deep into to that uh, in, with, with these la very large uh, solar PV plants. I would be very much interested in what your view is on, uh, on, on bringing private money uh, to these investments. Uh, see, you have the experience with these large installations. Are there any barriers still left after this, uh, these success stories? Thank you. Uh, I apologize first for my English, but I try to make myself clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for your invitation. And uh, so in Morocco, we began in 2010, we were at 26% um, uh, in terms of in, uh, installed capacity from renewable energy. So the target is now 42% by 2020, and we are pretty comfortable in uh, overpassing this objective. We have another objective, which is 52% by 2030. So the gap, 10 points of gap, means that we need to double the installed capacity also for renewable energy between 2020 and 2030. And, um, and uh, some studies are currently in progress in order and are, are giving some forecasts that we could maybe reach more than 52% and maybe between 60 and 70% and this time in terms of power generation from renewable energy. Uh, the experience of Morocco uh, as is quite, uh, was at the time quite innovative because it, uh, mobilized all the guarantees from the states in order to bring projects to a bankable stage. And thanks to this uh, scheme, we achieve it from very optimal price. Uh, we don't like to talk about low price in Morocco because, for example, we, we are focused on the optimal price, which means that we are not ready to destroy some value for example, using agricultural lands for power generation. And we are looking for what is the best way to add the, be, the, the best value at the country level, and not just only for energy. Which brings me to, to talk about the, these barriers. And maybe we, there is a very obvious uh, observation. So if we, I, I know it's quite difficult to compare between price uh, between uh, uh, to compare prices between uh, different countries. There are so many parameters that we have to take into account, so it's not uh, uh, always a very good uh, thing to compare this price. But we can say, we can uh, see that in France, for example, the last auctions came out with a price a little bit above five cents. And in Germany, I think you achieved something around six cents for solar. And the lowest price in Africa, if you exclude maybe North of Africa and South Africa, it's 
seven cents or six point five cents in in uh, in Zambia. So while the level of GHI, it's much higher in Zambia than in Germany. So it means that if we bring things at the same level, technical basis, excluding the financial axis, it means that the price is more than the double from sub-Saharan countries compared to, to North countries. So we see here that the power of finance in bringing price down. So what it brings me to say is that it's true that there are a lot of instruments, but I think that the instruments are not really adapted. For There is a perception of risk that is not really, that some in some cases is right, but in many cases is not, uh, is not uh, right. There is uh, an expectation of a very high RRI from developers when they come to sub-Saharan countries. And we see that in Europe, they will request an RRI around 7 or 8 percent, while they will not accept an RRI below 15 percent in African countries. So when you put all these things one above the other, you come out with, with a very high price, which is not renewable, while the resources are more abundant in sub-Saharan countries than in other countries. So maybe we have to push ourselves to be more innovative and to, to give birth to new instruments and also to avoid the subsidies because uh, to make projects bankable, even for scale in Sora, uh, they reached very wonderful things. But we have to bear in mind, to keep in mind that it's m massively subsidized. Because when we give sovereign guarantees for financing, when you, we give sovereign guarantees for like PRG, PCUA, for PPAs, so it's a kind of subsidy because it costs a lot for the countries to be able to provide that. And even and maybe the major cost, it's not when you focus on just on the energy, but the major cost, it's, it's we reduce the capacity of the country to invest in social sectors, like health, like education. So the price, if we compare the real price, it's much more higher. So maybe we are too focused on thinking energy for energy production <clears throat> and not, we are not having a holistic approach which means that we have to take energy like in Germany it's do I think it's under the Ministry of Economy energy but to take it from the economic perspective so how we can produce the right energy with the right price maybe eight cents what is the objective of the country if we are already paying 25 cents to kilowatt hour, is it really interesting to pay it at 3 cents or 4 cents, or maybe we can pay it at 8 cents and then make, uh, set up an industry for, for that and remove all the subsidiaries for financing, etc. So I call for more innovations for the instruments and not just to congratulate ourselves. So who, who would have to be brought together in order to achieve that? Well, say ultimately, there needs to be an investors who would be willing to invest. And when we talk about private investors, so they want to be rewarded for actual or perceived risks. I think that the, the scheme of uh, IFC, like mm -hmm. it's an equity fund, if I understood well, it's a very good ap approach and we have to see how we can uh, improve our governance to bring more uh, confidence for the um, private sector and to mobilize uh, private financing. Also when I see that the, the partnerships are theoretical for the mm -hmm. moment because if we come back to COP21, 22, 23 they are a promise of hundreds and billions uh, dollars and euros to be invested in renewable energy. But the reality is that they are not easy to be rich. They are not easy to be rich. Because we need to provide all the sovereign guarantees to be able to, mobil to mobilize this, this uh, concessional financings. 
but also we cannot leverage that by giving preferences in order to set up local industries. So this is why we have GCF, CTF that are saying that there is a lot of money that is available, but they don't find projects. So this is why I call to more innovations towards the instruments, because the needs of the countries are not really taken into account from a holistic point of view and economic point of view in order to refine the right instrument. But we take some instruments that are obliging the countries to give a lot of concessions, mm -hmm. where not, they are not always able to do so. Mm -hmm. And this is why there is not a, a good match between projects and financing who are, uh, which are available, but are not really easy to be mobilized. Thanks. I, so I would have quite a lot of questions, but maybe we uh, move first on uh, to Nora and, and Steve. And I, I would like to, to learn from the two of you, so having listened now for 55 minutes uh, or 45 minutes, uh, 10 minutes were, were mine, uh, 45 minutes to the different challenges uh, and successes uh, in, in different settings and contexts. One of them being that it is obviously a mismatch between risk, uh, pricing of risk um, and, and what can be paid actually locally. So how to bridge that? So would, uh, is the, the solution more in different new instruments? Are there any other solutions uh, that we might come to? Somewhere this Gordic knot has to be solved. And I can't quite see it, and I am looking at you now. <laughs> Thank you for looking at me. Um, actually, uh, taking reference to the last 55 minutes, mm -hmm. including also what you've been mm -hmm. presenting, I think uh, one key word here was people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned it mm -hmm. as well. Here and um, so, as um, um, Microenergy International, the Microenergy Group that I'm representing here, um, we are uh, a group of, of companies and organizations working the last 20 years towards a bottom-up energy transition. Bottom-up energy transition, and by the way, we got the Energy Transition Award last year here at the dialogue. Um, means to look at the energy transition from the perspective of people, households, and SMEs. So what are incentives, mechanisms uh, to mobilize private investment on the, people's, on the people's level, on the level of households, of enterprise, small enterprises who bring forward um, the, energy, uh, the energy transition? And um, interestingly, for example, from the slides that you've been showing, there were slides looking at, uh, uh, let's say, the, the how, how much dollars, euros have been invested into renewable energies or how much is the share of, in gigawatt. Yeah. I'm an engineer, I love to hear gigawatt and kilowatt, etc. But uh, one um, a slide I'm missing and I would love to see more in this type of conferences is actually how many people in which country, for example, or what, how big is the share of people in a country who are profiting from an energy transition? Um, um, you will maybe be surprised that uh, if you look like country, uh, worldwide in which country most of the uh, let's say a big, the biggest share of the population is actively involved in an energy transition process. Currently, number one is Bangladesh. 25% of rural population there are using solar energy to create, uh, generate their electricity. These are not megawatts, these are not billions of dollars, etc., but 25% of voters in that country who are part of this energy transition. In Germany is number two, it's about uh, two million people because also here many people are actually involved in this, uh, in this transitional uh, processes. So um, coming back a little bit to, to the questions of risk. So um, um, for 
um, us and me personally working now 20 years in uh, different energy transition uh, uh, processes, uh, in particularly in the global south, um, we believe that there is a there is a de-risking when we look not into the big scale renewable energy, but into the smaller um, scale renewable energy. I've been um, very uh, keen to hear uh, from Ghana the perspective on PPAs from a public point of view, because uh, um, let's say Ghana and Morocco are maybe countries in Africa where normally investors are quite trusting in because you know it's quite political stable etc but in in other places it's really a big question if you sign a ppa for 20 years are you going to get your your money back so uh, looking into a renewable energy transition which is where return on investment is not 20 years but two three years just because these are smaller renewable energies more decentralized uh, you have more distributed risks. Um, this is uh, um, at least something where um, I believe it's promising and there are a number of, of, of instruments uh, that I will not um, um, deploy here in detail, but I'm happy to share this uh, with you if you approach me afterwards. So it's worth to look into the instruments used in Bangladesh. Uh, in terms of, of particularly distributing renewable energy and empowering, enabling millions of people to be part of the transition. And, um, and also, um, um, my company is currently mandated by AFD Proparco um, to deploy the African Renewable Energy Scale-Up Facility which is an equity facility where we are uh, investing, e doing equity investments across Africa into companies who are deploying renewable energy, um, uh, renewable energies. And even there, our focus is really on distributed, decentralized renewable energy because of a lower risk that we see in smaller, uh, um, in, in, in smaller renewables, and particularly uh, where, let's say, the dependencies from political processes are not so big, but actually where the businesses are really depending from a tremendous demand that we have in, uh, in, in the African context. Um, just as a final example, um, yesterday I was speaking with an entrepreneur in Congo uh, who runs diesel mini grids in, uh, in, in eastern Congo and his customers pay two dollars a kilowatt hour. And for this entrepreneur it is super attractive to shift to solar energy and uh, he even doesn't need subsidies for this, etc. He needs securities, guarantees, etc. But on another on another level. Yes, thanks so much. Um, I, I would like to, to give it a try uh, with with you, Steve. So we have heard a lot uh, a lot about barriers and this dichotomy between. Uh, risk, willingness to pay, um, and returns required by investors. See, now yeah, looking think... at the larger ones, and then you as the uh, as repre representative of the wind industry, yeah. maybe are best suited to, to delve a little deeper on that. I think you perceive risk very, very differently if you're spending your own money, or as with governments, you're spending somebody else's money the taxpayers. You have a very, very different perspective on what constitutes risk. Um, and at, with our partners at the Global Solar Council and the Business and Investors Group at IRENA last year, we put together a paper, which I'd like to refer you to, which is from a private, perspective, private sector perspective about the barriers and risks associated with scaling up renewables in emerging markets. And having said that, since 2010, the, the majority, the vast majority of the investment in the wind energy sector has been outside the OECD. And the same has been true for the solar sector for at least the last two years, I believe, maybe even longer. But it's, it's the big markets. And it's the, the, the Chinas, the Brazil, Mexico, uh, India, South Africa, et cetera, where the majority of that investment has been going. And the challenge that we looked at was much more the smaller markets that we're talking where things haven't really taken off yet. Um, as the previous session said, there, there's no lack of capital. 
Uh, there's no lack of capital seeking a good home in renewable energy projects around the world. There is a, a lack of bankable projects um, because of the risks identified um, by the previous speakers. Uh, I could add to that list. The biggest one really is the fact that the off-taker risk um, because most of the time when you go to do a PPA with uh, the public sector owned utility in an emerging economy, you will find that on paper the utility is bankrupt. And your financier says, 20 years? Really? Um, they're bankrupt. I mean, this is the case in Sub-Saharan Africa, in many parts of Southeast Asia, and, and certainly in Latin America, where, to use an example, Argentina, for instance, which has defaulted on all its public loans, uh, three times in the last 14 years, a new government comes in, they want to get energy uh, revolution going in Argentina. Not only did they have to get the government to guarantee, place a sovereign guarantee on the distribution uh, company that was responsible for paying the PPAs, but also get the World Bank to back up the government. Investment is flowing now. Billions of dollars have come into the sector over the last two, three years, and it's taking off, and that confidence will be restored. But I don't think you should underestimate the risk from the perceived perception of an investor of a public sector utility which is in fact bankrupt. So those are the kinds, that is the place where the role of public finance is critical is to provide the guarantees to reduce those kinds of risks. There's also of course currency risk, political risks, a, a, a wide variety of other things. I think. Um, and then there's the market risk, of course, because you, have, you can sign a PPA, you can build your plant, but if you can't get your product to market, or you get curtailed because somebody who owns a fossil fuel plant knows the, the system operator better and makes them, you curtail the wind rather than curtailing the coal plant, that's a real problem. Um, it has been a huge problem in China. It's, a lot, it's getting better, but... It's, it's something that we have to deal with. So all of these things add to the cost. And when we talk about subsidies, let's not forget that fossil fuel, sub, fossil fuel industry, by the very conservative estimates of the IEA, are still three, four hundred billion dollars a year just on the consumption side, not to mention the hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred billion on the production side. And if you use the IMF met metric, you add a zero onto that. And that completely dwarfs any subsidies that you uh, are paying to, for the development of renewables. But I agree very much with what you said, is that the, the role of public finance, not only to supply, have a reliable electricity system, but to also achieve other social objectives, which are equally important, not only for buy-in of consumers, but also to help develop the local economy. And I would point to the REI PPP program in South Africa as a very good example about how local investment is part of the tendering system. You still get PPAs for wind and solar below, well below five US cents in South Africa, but with 30% of the value of, 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 of the criteria by which the bids, bids are valued, are evaluated rather, is on social um, criteria in terms of black empowerment and local enterprise ownership and community ownership and development and things like that. And they're built right into the auction process, which to me is a much more effective way than local content requirements um, in terms of developing investments that's going to matter in the long term in the local communities when you talk about attracting FDI. The other thing about reducing risk, um, which has been deployed across Latin America very successfully, uh, is the dollarization of the PPAs. All, everywhere in Latin America, PPAs for wind and solar are denominated in dollars, except Brazil. And they can do it in Brazil because they have the BNDS, which is a large public sector institution with billions and billions, of, with a license to print money and uh, lend billions of dollars for energy and infrastructure projects. Now, they've created a local industry um, as a result of that, because in order to qualify for that finance, which is the only long-term of finance available in Brazilian reais, you need to fulfill their local content requirements. They've created a very large industry but now they have an industry growing up right next door in Argentina, and they can't compete because the local content requirements means that their products are 30, 40% higher. So it's cheaper to ship in wind turbines from China or from Europe or from anywhere else than it is to drive them across the border from Brazil. So there are trade-offs. There's all kinds of trade-offs in these, and I think every country needs to look at their own 
public policy objectives in addition to energy when designing these systems. I think you're absolutely right. But then don't ask us to compete directly against uh, incredibly heavily subsidized components, uh, opponents, or the incumbents, the fossil fuel industry, or in fact the nuclear industry whose subsidies are in fact infinite, because if we required nuclear power plants to buy insurance, none of them could operate, because nobody would insure them, for obvious reasons. Um, in, and, and this is the thing that kind of annoys me a bit when I hear the thing about, oh, renewables have to compete on their own. Very happy. Make the nukes and fossils compete on their own without any subsidies, and we'll, we'll, we'll get on the same dance floor any day. But don't forget that. And we know that the subsidies aren't going to be taken away from fossil fuels. We've been trying to do it for 60 years. They're down a little bit, maybe. Um, nuclear, they'll never go away, or else they just have to shut all the plants down tomorrow. So accept that, or do something about it. And then we talk about how we incentivize renewables. Thanks so much, Steve. I'd like to come back uh, in, a, in a little moment. So there was one question uh, to, to you on, on the PPA, how, how they are perceived from, from the public uh, view in Ghana. Right, okay. Yeah. The PPA is how they are perceived on the public view. Um, the PPA is in Ghana, like I said, we, the previous government entered into several um, power purchase agreements um, in the hope of um, getting a lot of these um, entities to reach financial close within a couple of years. Unfortunately, they couldn't reach financial close, and we are lumbered with these um, PPAs, um, which we are now finding ways of um, rescheduling them. Because if you allow them, and indeed we've cancelled some of them and then paid penalties um, for them. For the simple reason that if you had allowed them to proceed, we would have ended up paying a lot of money for, um, uh, for power that we don't need. Um, capacity charge, that's what I mean. Um, so um, some have been left and uh, we've rescheduled them. And still we're looking for opportunities to disincentivize them so that we can create the space for much cheaper um, renewables. And that is what um, we are doing right, right now um, in Ghana. And we are very optimistic that um, we will create that space for the private sector um, in collaboration with the public sector to come in with the new um, renewables. And like I said earlier, the remaining 15% accessibility that um, is still there um, we are more than uh, happy if any investors here to uh, willing to come to Ghana to help um, with the distributors, solar, and um, uh, the mini grid system um, uh, to reach these um, communities that is too expensive for the local government to string um, lines to, 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 to these um, communities. Um, so that is uh, what is pertaining right now in, in Ghana. Mm. Thanks uh, so much. Uh, uh, Steve, um, we, we talked a little, uh, a lot about uh, these, uh, the, the, the challenge to, uh, to get over these risks, uh, to address these risks. Um, so we have the solutions IFC provides. Is this a route to go? Um, what do you think about this? I think the standardized contracts can help. I, I, and the standardized PPA agreements and all the rest of it can be a tremendous help. Um, is there a one-size-fits-all solution? No. I mean, you obviously have to adapt uh, to a certain extent to the local conditions. And, and then you always have the dynamic of how much conditionality do you want to impose upon the receiving country versus making the project, in fact, bankable and attracting finance. So there's always going to be a trade-off there. But I think each country could find the balance and use these tools. I mean, the IFC is one. I know Irina's working on, mm. on uh, another set for solar. It can be expanded to mm. be done for wind. Mm. Um, it's early days, but I, I would agree with your analysis. We have the tools. We just need to deploy them in the right combination at the right places and the right times. Mm. And 
and we'll, we'll get see. there. Well, what, what do you think about um, these, these partnerships? So they ha seem to happen now uh, with the support of IFC, uh, with these large uh, pools of money. So is this a, uh, one of the solutions you can think of maybe beneficial to, to get uh, money deployed? Um, and well, is it, or should they um, go directly without IFC, maybe with other means? Um, because IFC uh, was, uh, might even at times uh, have the risk of crowding out local private investments. Obviously, the best solution is to create a, a, a local financial sector which can handle it. As mm. to everyone's surprise, has worked really well in South Africa. Mm. They have a robust. Mm despite everything else that's going on there, the, the financial sector has remained pretty robust and have provided most of the, of the finance for the build-out of the renewables mm. in South Africa. And they're denominated in RAND. Mm. And, and so you, don't, you get away from the, there are still currency risks involved mm. in the project since, you know, at the beginning all the equipment is mm. imported and tied to a euro or a dollar or an mm. RMB. Um, but it has worked pretty well. But for, that's a big ask for a country the size of Ghana mm. or... Um, uh, other mm. countries in South Saharan Africa, mm. of course, we would like to see as much of the development and participation of the local finance sector as possible. But if you're talking about a rapid scale up and giving loans at a, at a, a rate which will make renewables possible with 20 year tenors, that's a big ask for, mm. for the financial sector of a small company, small country, and it's going to need time mm. to develop. And so you're going to need international mm. investors, either public or private. Um, I think to 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 play the the lion's share of the role in the beginning, and then mm. obviously hand it over to locals as quickly as possible. Like the example I used in Argentina, there's no local finance in Argentina now at all. Given the recent history of the country, that's mm. not surprising. We hope it will come, but that's going to take mm. years and years and years. Mm. Um, but every country is different. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Siri, and uh, I, I'd like now to, as we have, I think, 10 to 15 minutes left, we should have a, a, f a final round uh, so that uh, everyone can respond to this, these barriers we see uh, in, in various contexts. Contexts, uh, But as well, there were some solutions mentioned uh, by, by all of you, uh, and, and maybe reflecting a little bit on, on, on that, so in order to to try to find the way uh, that supports the way forward, in, in the local context, of course. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, ending the sentence with mm. the term local context. Mm. I think we cannot generalize the financing situations or the model that should be appropriate for financing a renewable energy project from one region to, an, to another or from one country. To, to the next, okay? But I think we all concur on one item, that moving forward, okay, private financing would be the way, it's the key to go, mm. okay? It's the way forward, moving forward. Public financing would be very limited, okay? And if in countries or region that has that limitation, then uh, institutional uh, institutions like uh, IFC, World Bank, and all the rest could play a very critical role, as they had done in the past, in terms of fostering the credibility of various countries' guarantee, the PPAs, and all the rest. Whereas in Thailand and most Southeast Asian countries, I think that issue is a little bit less uh, prevalent or less stressed than, than other region. We are moving forward in terms of our financial institutions. Local financial institutions in Thailand are quite uh, strong, credible, and their credit ratings are world class. So the issue of credit ratings or public fin uh, private financing for renewables, including wind, solar, and in uh, biomasses. It's not the issue of, uh, of uh, funding available. I think it's an issue of putting together large-scale projects or disputed projects that has a strong, sustainable uh, policy framework that would benefit all. Mm -hmm. both the investors and the consumers. Today, things are very transparent. You can read 
here and there that solar being bid out at two cents, three cents, here and there. So it's raising public awareness that in a competitive market, okay, it is feasible or possible to achieve so uh, low or equitable cost of uh, uh, renewable energy power, okay, I mean, to do good for the environment doesn't cost an arm and a leg. Mm. But the country needs to do a foundation or framework of regulatory, legal certainty, okay, including the credibility and uh, sovereign trustworthiness to bring about that condition. So it's not the role of the private sector or the private public sector alone. They should work hand in hand. What could be achieved, including local industrial development as well, the local components should be fit in appropriately. So I think this dialogue, exchanging views, would be uh, foster understanding for us to move forward. But critically, I think IFC has a very important role, as you had done for the oil and gas industry for over 50, 40, 50 years now, of fostering this uh, understanding and this equal, e e equitable okay, distribution of development throughout various countries, big, small, developed, or less developed. Thank you, and this dialogue has been excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Nora, say, what is your perspective then, um, having listened to, to everyone? Say, is, this, is there a, a silver bullet to, to this? Um, actually, I liked uh, your sentence, uh, what is the right energy at the right price? I would add to this something like right energy, what is the right energy, what is the right price, and what is actually the right target group? Um, I think that um, in the energy space, we are still very much trapped in a kind of technological trap, looking mainly at centralized and larger energy generation means, which make it very difficult to actually let the economy, the local economy, economy of small people participate in the energy system itself. And I, I, I think this is totally crucial. And taking really exactly what you've been saying, we have to be, think about a more inclusive energy sector in the sense that, yes, there, there is a public duty to take care of, of economy, social aspects, etc. But energy is not detached of social development. But, and of economic development anyhow not, but to think, if we think maybe, in, in, and, and, and we can think today smaller, not because we are more modest, but because today uh, a computer uh, IT technology allows us to put a lot of smartness and intelligence in something small, and we don't need any more rooms like this to host a computer, yes? So this is when I speak about small things. Um, uh, small can mean very big sm uh, smart smartness, yeah. Uh, but um, to, I, I think we have to think more cross-sectoral. And when we think about the energy future of the uh, the energy systems of the future, it means exactly how can farmers, how can small industries, etc., become not only consumers of energy, but actually become prosumers. Today, the technology, technological development that we see, not only in the, 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 the solar panels, solar cells, wind turbines, etc., and the storage um, technology, and particularly in ICT, enable us really to, um, yeah, uh, uh, to, to think in, in other dimensions and to think about much more about prosumption of energy and by supporting through public means the development of an energy system of the future, we can in the same mean, you know, develop the economy, develop uh, um, 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 s uh, specific social means, etc. So it's more um, for me and from my perspective an important mindset 
uh, mindset uh, change uh, into a more cross-sectoral thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nora. Dr. Kwon, see, in the Korean context, the, what will be the maybe next uh, measure you will have now on your mind to activate private investment? Oh, well, that's a good question, but it's not <laughs> easy to answer. Anyway, um, I think uh, economy is related to uh, psychology. The psychological factor is very important also to the uh, renewable energy transition. Mm -hmm. uh, but how to give credibility to the investors and uh, ordinary citizens? Uh, we should give more uh, political uh, consistency that can ensure their long-term uh, credibility uh, for the people to invest in a uh, new uh, renewable energy. So, uh, but the, to ensure uh, this uh, uh, long-term credibility, uh, we should also redesign the market uh, system uh, in a way that uh, introduce uh, the internalization of external costs mm. and also the um, the, uh, we also establish a green energy ecosystem uh, in terms of uh, economic and uh, environmental and socioeconomic uh, ways. So, you know, over the uh, all uh, the process of uh, production and distribution and, and con consumption, that this uh, by uh, green energy ecosystem can give more uh, long-term stability. And then, but as mentioned, Korea is very, the renewable energy share is very low, as I mentioned, 7%. Uh, I think it's due to the, uh, the limited space, uh, because Korea is an uh, industrialized but small country, so there are limited space for renewable energy potential. And then uh, also, but technological breakthrough is also uh, important, but they are uh, under uh, the, uh, the uh, a superficial uh, phenomenon, as I mentioned, the, the uh, credibility issues, and then also how to uh, induce uh, private investment. Um, that's why we need uh, to emphasize the role of uh, public uh, finance, the government sector, but, but because of limited uh, budget, we cannot uh, give uh, much budget to, to, that, to this area. So. Uh, but Korea, we have six uh, public power companies. Uh, we can give more role to play uh, for them because uh, this sort of some monopoly system. So uh, the six uh, public power companies, uh, they can uh, give uh, more uh, incentives to uh, local uh, citizens to participate. And also we can create some sort of uh, fund uh, sort of uh, participating, participatory fund, sort of a uh, crowding source or um, the renewable energy fund uh, whatsoever. Uh, so the, the, this fund can induce uh, you know, local residents from farmers and rural areas, they can participate, they can give equity or debt investment. Uh, and, and also, um, um, the, uh, the, the local uh, government's very uh, key role because you know, in a world of 3D uh, uh, decarbonization and decentralization and digitalized world, uh, the, uh, the local middle level uh, uh, stakeholders, middle level actors like local governments, uh, they are very good position to play. Mm -hmm. So in Korean context, I think that the kind of issues for psychological issues as institutional and, and also legal uh, instruments. Uh, we also considering feeding a Korean feeding tariff system will be introduced. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's very interesting. So we have to be a bit conscious of time. I think we are now um, running out of time. But I want to hear briefly, uh, you, Ali, um, what you make of this uh, brief exchange. And then I, I would like to, to hear one or two sentences from each of you as well. Uh, I'm going to make just one point on something, uh, yeah. not directly in relation, but with what you, you are asking for. But I'm going to jump off what she said. This is the first time I hear this word, prosumers. Mm -hmm. 
which is quite interesting. And I'm wondering that we are talking about what are the tools and the instruments to leverage finance, uh, private finance. And even if we had today the solution, it should be uh, feasible in five years. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking when prosumers, if we see in Morocco that some industries that are putting solar panels in the rooftops, are lowering their bills by more than 50 to 60 percent. This is also the case in Germany. Yeah, that's a prosumer. And this is why this is prosumers, mm -hmm. and this is why you have. I think you are the third country in the world in Germany with uh, uh, PV uh, capacity. Price of batteries are falling down very uh, heavily. What would happen? <clears throat> if solars with batteries are below the cost of the network. And we are to all talking about the network. So maybe, maybe we, are, we are just talking, I'm just realizing that we are talking about how to finance very large scales, renewable energy power plants. But what if, if we were in front of a very huge disruptions and most of the times, experts like us are not the right people to talk about <laughs> disruptions. <laughs> we're comp always completely wrong. <clears throat> so <clears throat> maybe we're facing a disruption and mm. some financial instrument should be adapted to mm. what is coming very rapidly. Yeah. Better than thinking about how fi financial instruments could uh, sustain or uh, things that are old or I don't know how we say it in English, but our, uh, come on, the old. <laughs> <laughs> Good, thanks. Um, the Minister, I do. Risks, uh, the Ghanaian um, situation, anything new to you? Disruption maybe coming to, to Ghana as well as to everywhere else? Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> I think my last comment, I would like to mm. dwell on this um, fear. <laughs> in inverted commas, fear by the international financial um, community in investing in the emerging markets. There are huge opportunities and huge amount of monies to be made there. I mean, uh, companies, um, uh, private money in the West, notwithstanding the assurances that is being given by the IFCs of this world, are still risk averse. And I would urge uh, the private money here in Gathered to get rid of this fear. Mm. Come to Africa. There's a lot of opportunities there. Mm. Come to Ghana. It's a gateway to West Africa. It's a huge potential market mm. there. And um, you will not regret it. <laughs> Very nice. Carsten. <laughs> I, I would very much like to second the statement. The opportunities are there. Institutions like us have been involved in the emerging markets for more than 60 years. I think we will be needed for a few more years in order to overcome perceived or also some real risks uh, related to emerging markets. But the world is going to become more connected. And so there will be more knowledge about market opportunities. And so we will hopefully also getting them financed with instruments that we will continue to developing. So I'm, I'm very positive about certainly also the energy sector. Yeah, I too am very optimistic about the <laughs> movement of the, of the, simply because of what you said, uh, about the rate of change and the disruption happening so quickly that a lot of things will happen now that in the next 10 or 15 years that we couldn't possibly predict today, mm -hmm. or at least we couldn't. Maybe mm -hmm. somebody out there is, has already figured it out. And that is a good thing, because on the current track they were on, there's no chance that we'll get anywhere near the goals agreed in the Paris Agreement. Um, we need basically, if when we'll see the 1.5 degrees report from the IPCC coming out over the course of the next six months and other scenarios that are done, and we basically need a decarbonized power sector by 2030. Certainly in the OECD and the rest of the world very shortly thereafter, if we're going to have any chance of meeting the Paris climate targets. And while we have the technology to do it now, we don't have the financing instruments or the policy to get us there. 
So massive disruption is, is not only inevitable, it's required. Mm. Good, thanks. Uh, Janelle, if you can come on stage to present the results of the poll. With pleasure. So when you saw me last, we asked you which way of public and private collaboration looks most promising for scaling renewable energy and energy efficiency partnerships in future energy markets. The winning answer with 58% is investment partnerships, followed by the public role being towards regulation. Nobody voted for the options blended finance and no collaboration needed. So take what you will out of that. Yeah, that's a very interesting result. I would have expected that someone would uh, vote for blended finance, but it's an interesting result. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think blended finance um, uh, focuses much more on um, on bringing the the public and the private money together. So it's very similar to what IFC does. Uh, whereas uh, the the first part, um, I think, is, is slightly different uh, in at least to my understanding. But we have maybe another time to discuss that. But say, just summarizing um, the panel in, in, in only a few words. So what I heard is very much about, OK, some disruption is maybe looming uh, because of different reasons. Say, prices uh, seem to be a big issue. Still, leveling playing field is still not there in, at, at all places. But there's uh, quite some hope, in particular with uh, involving smaller scale uh, investors, smaller scale actors, uh, people uh, that are now, like your example with Bangladesh, are now more and more benefiting from the energy transition, be it with energy efficiency, be it with involvement in, for instance, small scale solar solutions. So that's uh, one. And if that's encompassed by, and then that is your point and, and, and your point from Korea and from, from Thailand in particular, with uh, increased credibility uh, that is added to the sector that ultimately drives down uh, price differentials when it comes to investment, require, investment return requirements. Uh, see, this is, for me personally, the, the major takeaway. And I, I think you are pretty much right in, in kind of pushing, OK, we don't have time too much. See, there is quite a lot ongoing, but certainly not enough, even not with the numbers we just see. So there's a gap still uh, there. So with that, I'd like to close this panel. I would like to, uh, to thank you all uh, for your contributions. I think that was very helpful, very constructive. Yeah, and I look forward uh, to collaborating sometime in future. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.